From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now, at the NYSE and at ISIS exchanges and clearinghouses around the world. And now, welcome Inside the Ice House. It is the holiday season, which means across the country, people are embarking on their yearly traditions, albeit many with COVID-related adjustments to ensure a happy and healthy new year. For my house, that means pulling out the decorations, making latkes, and of course, the daily delivery of holiday cheer, which is what I call the impromptu meeting of the UPS and FedEx drivers dropping off boxes on my front porch. The National Retail Federation expects Americans to spend about $700 on gifts between November and the end of the year. Most of that money will be spent the old-fashioned way, but more than ever, it'll be done contactless over the internet. Online sales went from 5% to 12% of U.S. retail between 2012 and 2019. For obvious reasons, this year supercharged the sector, leading to almost an equal-sized growth in just six months. According to a recent tweet from Amplify ETFs, 2020 will see online sales grow 33% year-over-year, totaling nearly $200 billion. That wasn't the only helpful advice offered to me by the Twitter account as I scrolled through the feed. Another tweet gave me advice on what was the best day to get a deal for every item on my holiday shopping list. By the time you're listening to this episode, you missed the best chance to get a new computer. That was November 28th. But if your list includes a new power drill, the secret is to wait until after Christmas on December 26th. I just hope the recipient understands. You may be wondering why an ETF issue is tweeting out holiday shopping secrets unless you know about the Amplify Online Retail ETF, NYSE ARCA ticker iBuy. The ETF is the first, and with over $1.2 billion in assets under management, the largest offering from Amplify. The product, which provides exposure to online retail, has seen unprecedented growth over the course of 2020. Our conversation with Christian Magoon, founder and CEO of Amplify ETFs, on investing in the economy of today and tomorrow, pioneering thematic ETFs, and when is the right time to buy that perfect gift is coming up after this break. Navigating dynamic markets requires a relentless pursuit of knowledge. Now, join market experts to learn with ICE Education Live. Attend live video training with practical lessons across global asset classes. On-demand modules provide base knowledge. Participants can then attend live training sessions, including group review and tests for certification. We also tailor training for your needs and in-house projects. ICE Education Live Courses. Continue your education today. Our guest today, Christian Magoon, is founder and CEO of Amplify ETFs. Christian has launched over 70 ETFs in the United States to date. Previously, he served as president of Claymore Securities, where he launched their ETF business in 2006 and is also founder of Magoon Capital LLC. Christian, welcome inside the ICE house. Hey, thanks, Pete. Good to be with you and happy holidays. Thank you. So most of I think would be reticent to mention how much of their first workday after Thanksgiving they spent checking out Cyber Monday. But as I mentioned in the intro, it's sort of core to one of your marquee ETFs. Did you grab any deals yesterday while monitoring how the sector was doing? Yeah, I, I actually did a lot of shopping. And you know, this year has been interesting, especially online. Um, many of the deals started earlier than Black Friday or Cyber Monday. Thanksgiving actually was a huge uptick in online spending, up almost 40% year over year. And it's because many of the brick and mortar stores were closed. So people were hopping on their phones uh, on Thanksgiving night. It's more socially acceptable than ever to do some of those uh, holiday shopping errands uh, from their couch. So yeah, I purchased a few gifts for uh, my my family and uh, I'm guessing I'll have a lot of cardboard boxes outside my door pretty soon. So this year, we're seeing for the first time, a lot of small and medium businesses are now actually competing with the big box stores. Have you seen an impact from that yet? Has companies like Shopify that underpin these really seen a, a, re, a growth over 2020? Yeah, they ab- absolutely have. I mean, it's become material now to have a, a robust online presence. 
And companies like Shopify, which I think is NYSE listed, um, they do a great job of getting uh, small and medium sized businesses up to speed. You know, we have an ETF, the largest of online retail stocks, and there's several different segments in there. One type of online retail stock is these online platform stocks. So these companies that provide a platform for third parties. Now, Amazon does some of that, eBay, Shopify, there's a variety of, of companies like that. And they've been really um, kind of an essential business as there's been so many physical restrictions for brick and mortar stores, especially the mom and pops out there that haven't been really dubbed to be essential um, uh, shopping destinations. So yeah, across the board, whether you're in just direct to retail online, or you're providing a platform, um, or even some of the different services related to online, there's been a, a huge boon in that because um, we've seen probably about two years worth of market share growth here in this kind of COVID economy for online retail. Is it possible you have to figure out how much of that is just simply people can't go to the store and how much of that is actually changing consumer behavior? The trend had already been fairly robust for the growth of online retail. Uh, the U.S. Census Bureau started uh, measuring online retail sales in the U.S. all the way back in 1999. And back then it was less than 1% of all sales. And, and um, coming into this year, it was right around that 12% mark. Um, now we've already seen that, uh, so that growth is right around 20%. Uh, compounded average growth rate going back to uh, 1999. So very healthy, uh, but still, you know, at you know 12%, that's a very small percentage of overall overall U.S. retail sales. Uh, the latest number from the U.S. Census Bureau uh, about two months ago was that 16% market share is now where online is. So a big move, and we expect that you know could get as high as 20% by year end. Um, you know, some believe that you know U.S. Uh, online retail sales will eventually be 50% of all uh, retail sales here within the next five years. So very healthy growth rate. COVID really accelerated a trend that already was, was occurring. And as you know, you know, humans are kind of a habit-based creatures. So you start to buy online for the first time, or you do more of your online shopping, and it, it really becomes part of your habit. Usually about 60 days is what it takes to uh, create a habit. And we've certainly been in this COVID economy for more than 60 days. So we think that you know once the reopening fully occurs, let's hopefully say in 2021, there will be some people who kind of go back to uh, you know going to brick and mortar stores but you know online has some or online retail has some really big benefits I mean right now one of the benefits that people like we believe is just the convenience right you don't have to go to the store you don't have to take the extra risk but historically the big benefit that shoppers perceive from online retail is uh, is pricing competitive pricing and that means uh, being able to kind of quickly assess whether this is a fair price to be basically uh, generally get competitive pricing um, or price matching online. So we think that, you know, is kind of a, a, a key appeal. And, and certainly during the COVID economy and post recovery, we think people are going to be kind of uh, very sensible about their, their money. So we think that price uh, competitiveness that online offers should be uh, continuing to you know, bring people into the online fold. The other thing I would just say is selection is a big deal for online retail. How many times have we gone in and they don't have the, the toy or the color or the size in a physical store? And a lot of times they point you online anyway. So having increased selection is a real big benefit for online retail. So those are kind of the three, uh, we think, all weather um, types of appeal for online retailers. And that's why we see them being really the bright spot of, um, you know, overall retail sales. This holiday season, uh, you know, they're estimating spending is supposed to be up three to 5% across all retail. Online, however, is supposed to be up closer to 30%. So it is the, the bright spot, the, the area that's continued to do well, not only in the COVID economy, but even over the last uh, four years or so. When you think about online, you know, one of the things, you know, Black Friday is great for, for the retail side, but it really, if you think about the companies, it's when they get into the black, it's when they make a profit for the first yes. time. Do you see an online retail, are they as tied to that cyclical nature of holidays or are they sort of more steady throughout the year? Yeah, so they tend to have a big buildup of sales around those holiday uh, shopping. So it used to be that, um, you know, kind of back to school was a, it was a key motivator. Now that's kind of been become a little bit of bit fuzzy. And really going into the holiday shopping season, kind of those, you know, 
what they call the core five, you know, holidays, uh, shopping events. I changed about two years ago when Amazon introduced Prime Day. And Prime Day really gave a huge shot in the arm to retailers, both online and frankly, brick and mortar that have an online presence in the summer. And that pulled some of the traditional back to school shopping into those that summer months. Um, in addition, there were started to become more people who are doing their holiday shopping in the middle of the summer because they had increased uh, you know, selection and knew that they could have that item already taken care of. This year was a little bit weird because of COVID. You know, Amazon really had to push Prime Day due to supply issues into the fall. And that probably took a little bit out of the steam here of, of the hol of holiday shopping. But no question about it, holiday shopping is huge, uh, not only for brick and mortar, but for online. And, um, you know, that's the one area that online does disproportionately well. So last year when, you know, e-commerce was around 11% of online, re of total U.S. sales, the holiday shopping period, it was actually more like 20%. So online gets a disproportionate amount of share during the holiday. In this uh, holiday season, we think that market share could be as high as 50% for online retail, especially uh, due to the increasing restrictions that are starting to kind of happen around the country. Black Friday this year in 2020 was the second biggest shopping uh, holiday ever. And yesterday on Cyber Monday was the largest shopping uh, holiday ever in the history of the U.S. So uh, really good numbers. Uh, it's a little bit of a tongue in cheek, though, because online each year is setting new records. Uh, and it's just because of the trend towards digitization and shopping. And we're also recording this, you mentioned Cyber Monday being yesterday, on another online holiday that, that didn't exist back uh, years ago, which is Giving Tuesday. Uh, which also in 2020, you know, particularly with the impact of COVID is probably had more importance to nonprofits and, and colleges. In preparing for this, I learned a couple of interesting things, one, including that uh, both you and your wife have a uh, scholarship at Wheaton College. Is that where you, you guys met? That is our kind of our history. And, you know, the, the thought was to provide a, a scholarship for um, kind of underprivileged kids uh, to be able to go to that school. It's a liberal arts school and um, there is some, you know, larger costs associated with that, which can be prohibitive uh, depending on, you know, your financial condition or even a um, little bit um, based off the kind of the cost of a liberal arts degree. And um, yeah, we wanted to do that as a, as a way to, you know, give back. And, um, you know, it's interesting when you look at, you know, kind of online, um, you know, it used to be that people would write a lot of checks on like a Giving Tuesday. And now a lot of these payments are increasingly going digital. And um, that is another area that kind of at least our ETF benefits from um, having some of those payment providers in there um, because, you know, it's just a changing world um, either, you know, due to convenience or due to safety issues, you know, cash is starting just to go out the window. And that's kind of an interesting trend that tends to benefit these online businesses. You know, we're a lot more comfortable now making a donation, um, you know, paying for a large item. Uh, via our uh, electronic device, um, kind of the one of the big things, kind of w which I think we'll probably see on Giving Tuesday as well. But in terms of online shopping this year, believe it or not, about 42% of online shopping should be done from a phone this year, which is unbelievable. Um, it used to be that you know larger items and the majority really were done via a, a computer or a laptop, right? Um, but people are becoming more and more you know, comfortable being able to transact in even larger amounts um, via their mobile device. And um, that's a, just a neat trend that um, I think hopefully will be beneficial on Giving Tuesday here to many of these charities who might not even be able to have their doors open right now to accept um, you know, a gift uh, or a donation in kind physically. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if we see some of that similar stats uh, go through into the into that um, kind of the charitable side um, certainly there's a great need for it right now in terms of what COVID has done specifically for many service and hospitality workers and um, you know we've been a big advocate for seeing some more stimulus and especially stimulus targeted to those industries um, you know they're um, definitely been hard hit. And, uh, you know, in our ETF, we do have actually some exposure to some of the online travel stocks. Um, so the Expedia is the trip advisors of the world because uh, that industry has been changed by, by online retail. And quite frankly, it's hindered our performance in our ETF this year. Now, with that being said, our ETF is up over 100 and 
percent this year. So it's been a big winner, but it also, um, that's exposure that's hindered it actually gives us potentially some wind in our sails for a potential reopening uh, later this year. So, you know, if things start to reopen TripAdvisor, Expedia, I think there's going to be a massive rush to, to travel. Uh, many of us have been pent up for now quite a bit, and uh, that should be kind of an interesting pivot uh, that many people don't necessarily think all the time about, you know, kind of how uh, that industry works and how friendly and changed it is versus, uh, you know, years ago where you were doing paper tickets and paper book booking or even doing on the phone. Now it's almost all digital. And uh, that's a kind of an interesting area um, going into 2021 for, for at least our online retail ETF. We have about 7% of the portfolio exposed to that area. Yeah. And I mean, people are not only pent up, I mean, there's more cash pent up than, than ever before as well. People want to spend uh, on vacations and other things. I was thinking about the, the history of ETFs. And one thing I learned in, in the reason why I brought up Wheaton is I did not know until I prepared for this podcast that Wheaton, Illinois is not only home to Amplify ETFs, but it's actually the epicenter of the ETF world. Uh, past Our past podcast guest, Bruce Bond, is from there. Several companies in the ETF space were founded by even Wheaton College alumni. So a liberal arts school with, a, with an interesting uh, amount of financial history and includes Jim Bowen, who founded First Trust, which is where I believe that that's where you got your start. Yeah, so believe it or not, I worked with Bruce Bond uh, at First Trust um, in the like mid '90s, and you know, previous to all the different things that we've been involved in since then. So, yeah, there's a kind of a unique financial history, especially as it pertains to call it financial products, um, whether it's uh, exchange traded funds, unit investment trusts, closed end funds, um, a variety of kind of connections in that that sphere and. Not sure exactly why that is, um, but um, I think uh, it goes back to Robert Van Campen, who was a kind of financial executive that had a background um, with the with the school. And there's a variety of companies that kind of came out of that. And of course, I think Van Campen now today is part of Invesco. So uh, yeah, it's just interesting. Wheaton has a variety of different legacies. Probably the least of it um, uh, maybe recognized would be some of that uh, legacy in the financial side. And certainly if you look at you know Jim Bowen uh, and Bruce Bond, both have been unbelievably successful and um, uh, people that I think um, have left a big uh, imprint in the industry. They're they're both you know, 10, 15, maybe years older than I am. They've been in the industry a lot uh, longer than I have. Um, but you know, I, I look at them and I say, boy, it's pretty exciting to see what they've done. And you know, I hope to have even half the impact that they've been able to have in kind of the, uh, the financial services area in terms of doing some of these different types of products and their, the innovation they've brought to the space. So um, yeah, it's fun um, being in some ways mentioned um, in that same company. When you showed up at Wheaton, was that your plan to go into financial services or, or how did you come across your, your first ETF? I mean, if I do my math right, you, you showed up around when SPY was being launched. Yeah. So, you know, I have a Peter Lynch book that my, my dad gave me when I was probably about seven years old and I was kind of interested in finance um, from a young age. Um, my uh, father was a financial advisor and actually both sets of my uh grandfathers were financial advisors. So it was talked about a lot in our family and I was kind of interested in it. So I was always reading about it, you know, went to Wheaton, you know, I really kind of maintained that interest and um, was fortunate enough to get an internship when I was there at First Trust Portfolios. It was known as a different company at that time called Nike Securities. And, um, you know, kind of really learned the business there in a different way, more in a practical way, and ended up uh, getting my first job out of college there. And, um, you know, I think I kind of view myself as a student teacher when it comes to our industry. I really like learning about, you know, a lot of the innovative things that are going on. I like learning about the different investment opportunities. Uh, and then I like being able to turn around and kind of teach that, if you will. And I think that's why when you kind of look at what I've been involved with from a business standpoint, in terms of product launches, et cetera. Most of what I've done has been kind of first to market products, unique strategies that we're trying to provide access to uh, that, you know, expand the toolbox for financial advisors and investors. So whether it be like the first online retail ETF, and now there's a slew of them out there, or, you know, the first solar energy ETF or first China technology ETF, all these types of kind of first to market products kind of came, I think, as a result of me being 
being a student, either with people doing research or, you know, being inquisitive on certain areas or people approaching me saying, hey, do you know about this opportunity? I think the package product format, something I, I was always attracted to uh, just because I think you can harness expertise and then deliver it to investors and let them be the you know decision maker on what their allocation or risk tolerance was you know growing up with a bunch of financial advisors around me i wasn't that interested in, in dealing with you know hundreds of clients and determining their risk tolerance and taking the phone calls when markets are up or down i really wanted to instead um, create the tools that people can then use and especially with with financial advisors so it's been it's been a fun journey and I've enjoyed it and uh, you know amplify has been um, a, a project here we're almost five years old as a company and um, as you said iBuy was our first first fund and is our most successful thus far and it's been fun I mean when you look across our product line we have you know everything from you know online retail to a can a legal cannabis ETF uh, to a blockchain focused ETF, uh, to a black swan ETF that did well during the COVID crisis and, uh, you know, a variety of different kind of unique, uh, niches that, you know, I think have added value to investors. And for me, that's personally satisfying. I had to update my, my script this morning because I was going to say, you know, you've launched nine ETFs since 2016 under Amplify, but as of this morning, I believe it is now 10. That's right. So just this morning we launched the Amplify Pure Junior Gold Miners ETF on the New York Stock Exchange. The ticker is JGLD. J Gold is kind of what we what we say about it. And we really saw an opportunity there because there is a fairly large um, uh, gold mining ETF that has been so successful. I think it's like six billion in assets that it's had to change its focus or its index several different times to buy larger and larger stocks and include other companies that aren't necessarily gold miners. So um, we saw an opportunity to bring a pure product, kind of going back to the roots of this original product where we're able to provide, you know, kind of pure access to junior gold mining uh, stocks. And, you know, if you're familiar with kind of gold and gold miners, you know that when gold appreciates, gold miners tend to appreciate historically two to four times more because it's more of a leverage place, definitely more aggressive and more volatile than gold. So we wanted to provide kind of a, a back to the basics, pure play on junior gold miners and try not to have any silver stocks in, in our ETF, which some of the larger ETFs do, and try to focus on the smaller companies. You know, some of the legacy products have as much as 30% of their portfolio in large cap stocks, even though they're called a junior gold miner ETF. So I think we have at inception 88% of our, our, our exposure to kind of these small to mid cap companies. So this is a, you know, a little bit off script in terms of it not being quote unquote the first, but in some ways it really is the the only now way to play this uh, this space from a pure investment standpoint. And you know we look at gold and think with all the federal stimulus dollars that have happened and are going to continue to happen over the next probably six months. We think kind of these finite asset. Um, um, areas like gold, like silver, potentially even like Bitcoin, uh, can really um, appreciate. So now we'll have kind of a, a, a an avenue for investors to access gold via these junior gold stocks with J Gold, and then also an, a way to access um, Bitcoin and, and blockchain companies with our um, BLOK, our Block ETF, which actually owns some uh, Bitcoin in it via a GBTC uh, position. I just saw the other day that about 20% of all dollars that are outside or that are circulating right now were printed in 2020 to give you an idea of how much stimulus is out there. So excited about that area as well. So what, what I'm taking is, you know, an Amplify ETF is cutting edge. It's pure play. And we'll get into the, the two pure play re online retail ones in the second half. But is there anything else that's the overall arching philosophy that defines an Amplify ETF? Yeah, I mean, I think of the word disruption. I think what we're really trying to do is capitalize on a lot of the disruption that's happening in the uh, world today. We tend to play on disruptive trends. I don't want to give all our secrets away and how we find kind of opportunities, but you know, disruptive trends can be consumer trends, could be demographics, it could be you know, policy changes in geopolitics. Um, I think that's another uh, area that I think we've been able to capitalize on and, and look to uh, do that in the future as well. Well, after this short disruption, uh, Christian Magoon, 
founder and CEO of Amplify ETFs, and I will discuss how Amplify Online Retail ETF, that's NYSE ARCA ticker iBuy, and Amplify International Online ETF, NYSE ARCA ticker XBuy, help investors gain exposure in the growing online retail sector. We'll be back right after this break. Hi, I'm Axios Business Editor Dan Primack, host of Axios Recap, a new weekday podcast featuring interviews that get straight to the point. My guests are business leaders, politicians, and reporters driving the day's biggest stories. We're joined now by Jalen Rose. Thanks a lot. Bill Ackman. Thank you so much. Senator Amy Klobuchar. Thank you, Dan. Steven Soderbergh. Thanks for having us. Andrew Yang. Thank you. It's a pleasure. You can find Axios Recap on Apple or Spotify or wherever you like to listen to podcasts. Welcome back. Before the break, Christian Magoon, founder and CEO of Amplify ETFs, and I were discussing his career and the philosophy behind Amplify ETFs. So we were talking a little bit about Pure Play. Your company has two Pure Play online retail ETFs. One, as I mentioned, the Amplify online retail ETF, and that's iBuy. And then the Amplify international online ETF, XBuy, that provide exposure to businesses with 70 and 90% of their revenue coming from online sales, respectively. We discussed online retail at the top of the conversation, but what are the kinds of companies that go into these indexes? You get companies that um, really fall into three categories in the case of our ETF. So you get platform companies, which we mentioned early on. These are companies that operate e-commerce platforms that help others kind of sell on their platforms. So, you know, the, the, the quick thought on that would be like an, a Shopify, uh, an eBay. Uh, you could say Amazon is, although Amazon kind of qualifies in two different areas. Um, the, you know, the next area is really these uh, traditional retailers that are essentially selling direct online. And um, there's some interesting, uh, you know, companies that come up. So uh, Peloton would be one, um, Etsy, uh, Stitch Fix, uh, Chewy, uh, Overstock. Um, these are uh, Land's End, believe it or not, Pet Meds, uh, Chegg on the educational side, Shutterstock. A um, variety of companies there that are basically, you know, don't really operate uh, much physically and essentially do majority of their revenue um, online. And then the third area, uh, which is really the smallest area of iBuy's uh, allocation, again, around seven or eight percent is online travel. Um, so you get, you know, the TripAdvisors, uh, Expedia. Um, you could also add uh, like an Uber, a Lyft. Uh, to that area. Uh, there's also um, one or two companies overseas that uh, do a lot of the um, um, travel, for example, out of China, uh, kind of the Expedia of China, if you will. So uh, you get a kind of a variety or a mix of companies um, that, that qualify. I think the secret, though, to our ETF, besides the purity, is our weighting scheme. And weighting scheme simply means what do we weight each stock? And, you know, you look at something like the S&P 500, a well-known index, that's a market cap weighted index so that a company is weighted based off their overall market cap. And you can see some pretty heavy concentrations in companies like that. Um, you know, the index that we track is actually equal weighted. And that means that... Um, each company in that 75% U.S. sleeve is equally weighted. And then every company on the 25% international sleeve is equally weighted. So in other words, Amazon has the same weight as Etsy or Peloton, for example. And um, a lot of people are surprised when they see that because most people are used to market cap weighting. They'll look at our you know, top fund holdings, for example, and, and they're, oftentimes Amazon isn't even in our top 10 because of other you know, companies just performing better. And indeed, you know, as I'm looking at this right now, Amazon isn't in our top 10. And in fact, earlier this year, Amazon was only the 22nd best performing uh, online retail stock. So many of these smaller companies can have some outsized uh, appreciation. If you think about it, it kind of makes sense. Number one, they tend to be more pure play focused on online retail. With Amazon, you have in some of these larger companies, including like an Alibaba on the international side, they have multiple businesses. They've expanded over time and they're involved in a variety of different things. Like for example, Amazon and AWS, 
Uh, you know, if Amazon comes out with earnings and has a bad AWS cloud computing number, that can really impact the stock, even though they might have a record uh, online retail number. Uh, AWS is really kind of their fastest growing business um, versus something like an Etsy, a, a group like Etsy or Peloton or Chewy, 100% of their focus is online and they will be the most sensitive to the overall growth of online here in the U.S. and around the world. So, we really think being equal weighted is important and has led to kind of the outperformance we've had. If you can believe this, Pete, if you go back to April 20th of 2016, which is when I buy launch. So April of 2016 through November 30th, um, kind of the end of the month in November, um, QQQ or the NASDAQ 100, um, you know, has had substantial performance, 181% of return going back uh, to April of 2020. The S&P has only done 88% during that time frame. iBuy has done 318% going back to April of 2016. Uh, uh, so um, not quite double what QQQ has done, um, almost four times what the S&P 500 has done. This has really been a sweet spot, not just you know for uh, the retail sector, but for investors overall. And we think we're still only in the beginning. I mean, with market share only around 16% for online retail and some suggesting it can go to closer to 50% in the coming three to five years, uh, we think there's a lot of opportunity here. And thus we think being pure play, being equally weighted makes a lot of sense. Um, and you know, who knows, we'll see what happens. But um, you know, this COVID um, kind of acceleration, uh, we may not go back to kind of the old days where people go into stores as much going forward because they've experienced some of the benefits here of shopping online. Well, so if people don't go back to the stores though, I was thinking about this, you know, these larger retail companies, you mentioned Target about 10% of its online. When those now begin to transition more to 50%, is that a case where these pure play online retail companies will be edged out or does just sort of the rising tide of the online economy float all boats? Yeah, it's a good question. So probably what's gonna happen really is what we call like omni-channel retail. And it basically it's a seamless experience where you are more likely to buy online, but you have the ability to go in store or pick up in store or get delivered to store or get delivered to home or get delivered to a locker, kind of this seamless integration. And um, no question, brick and mortar is not going away, but it's probably likely to consolidate amongst kind of the better players. And that would be, you know, more forward looking, those that embrace online that do see this omni-channel experience. So think of Walmart, uh, you know, they introduced Walmart Plus this year as kind of a step forward, uh, you know, to kind of compete against Amazon Prime. Think of Target, I think is well positioned. Um, so likely what we're, we're probably going to see is, um, you know, this year will be probably a record amount of store closures and bankruptcies. That will probably flow a lot into these bigger, uh, these bigger brands like Walmart and Target. But we'll also see probably some of these online retailers uh, like a, like an Amazon, maybe even Alibaba, start to scoop up some of these failed brick and mortar um, operations to turn them into um, not just a store, but also a delivery center, potentially um, ability to have lockers, maybe even a, a shipping area. Uh, an ability to deliver uh, locally via drones even, uh, you know, just kind of a little bit crazy, almost like a Jetsons type future, but um, we're going to see more of a mesh there. So um, the, the one thing about, I think these smaller online retail brands, they're kind of in a great position because they are essentially in between call it the large online champions um, that really have global ambitions. Amazon, Alibaba, Mercado, Libre uh, would be great examples. They're between them and they're between these brick and mortar behemoths who are really seeing, hey, all the growth is happening online. We got to get better there when that's Walmart, Target, et cetera. And I think with a lot of these small online retailers are, are poised for some substantial M&A activity. And I think because of that, they're going to, you know, command premium valuations. Um, you know, how big of a move would it be if Walmart, who typically is kind of known as a big box store, says, you know what, what we don't have is a lot of personalized gifts and we don't have kind of some of the unique things that people come to stores to find. We're going to buy Etsy and we're going to create mini Etsy shops within Walmart to, to create 
some of these unique gifts that have more of an artisanal feel to create more of an experience in the Walmart store so it doesn't feel so sterile. Um, you can see that happening. Likewise, you can see Amazon saying, hey, we're a platform, we host all these individual merchants or whatever. We want Etsy because that's an area that we think is going to be more important as customers increasingly want custom customization and, and they want to give gifts that have maybe a story behind that. So you see all of these um, you know, companies that kind of fit between those two bookends as really having kind of a bright future. And you know what, if they, you know, are able to stay independent, um, it's likely they're staying independent because they're doing quite well and kind of own that niche. I think of like a Peloton, for example, um, or a Chegg um, on the educational side. Uh, so it, it's going to be exciting to see what happens over the next five years because I think there's going to be a big transformation. And I think the after effects of COVID um, are also going to be quite interesting because, again, you know, less cash, um, uh, more digital payments. We're seeing 5G rollout, which is very friendly for online retail. It's just quite amazing to see. Um, we're trying to think forward as to what that could look like. And, um, you know, we see just a lot of benefits for companies that are embracing kind of the digitization of, of consumer shopping and behavior. Similar to that, you mentioned earlier how a lot of the re online retail is over the phone now. And I was wondering, are you seeing any sort of leading indicators in XBuy, which is more internationally focused, where, you know, many of the developing countries and international companies are skipping sort of the desktop phase of technology. Are you able to see anything in that, in that particular ETF that helps you guess or, or, or predict where iBuy might be headed as the U.S. follows that direction of more phone-driven economy? Yeah, Pete, I mean, I like that question and I like your thinking because we definitely are seeing leapfrogging happening in parts of Africa, Southeast Asia. Um, you know, believe it or not, some of these countries that I think some Americans kind of feel like are maybe behind where the U.S. Uh, might be are actually ahead of the U.S. when it comes to some of these consumer trends. Um, you know, market share in, in, in China and in Japan and parts of developed Europe for online retail is already over 20%. Um, and we're seeing embracing of, of new types of delivery like drone delivery in areas like China that's, that hasn't been happening here in the U.S. Um, we're seeing, uh, you know, uh, people have their first phone be a smartphone in parts of Africa and Southeast Asia, where in the U.S. there's still you know, flip phones running around uh, with a large percentage of the population. So definitely um, international is quite exciting. Um, you know, XBuy is really what I would call one of our hidden gem ETFs. It's fairly new. Um, and, you know, this year so far, it's the 30th best performing ETF out of over 2000 ETFs in the U S but, you know, it doesn't have the billion dollar of assets that I buy is it's just kind of getting, um, it's, it's groove. It's less, you know, it's like, less than two years old here, uh, but its performance has been great. And we really think international might actually have more opportunity than kind of a domestic focus because the demographics are younger. As you said, they're embracing new technology quicker. Um, already market share is uh, larger in some of those countries for online and it's growing at a faster rate. I think the U.S. is, uh, when you look at like a country table is, you know, about 10th in terms of online retail growth uh, year over year, looking at the last full year number of 2019, meaning there's like nine other countries and various regions that are growing quite a bit faster than the U.S. Uh, the other thing that's kind of interesting just from a tactical standpoint is, well, there's been so much federal stimulus here in the U.S. and we've seen markets rebound. That really hasn't been the case uh, outside the U.S., there's kind of a muted recovery. And part of it is kind of how COVID affected many of those areas. China probably be the exception because it kind of had it early and then got over it a lot more uh, quickly. But certainly Europe and parts of Africa, um, even like India are in um, a lot more difficult uh, stages and haven't really seen the breakout, if you will, uh, like we've seen in the US for the equity market. So in some ways there might actually be more value and more kind of recovery upside uh, in international over the next like 12 to 18 months than there would be in a more domestic focused area. With that being said, it's hard to ignore uh, domestic, you know, uh, online retailers because it's such a, 
a great market when you're doing the majority of your sales here in the U.S. That the U.S. consumer is in a good spot, and there's likely to be a lot more stimulus. You know, you're talking about hundreds of millions of stimulus overseas in various countries. Here in the U.S., you're generally talking about trillions of dollars of stimulus, and that's really a positive thing for consumer behavior. You had mentioned the Amplify Transformational Data Sharing ETF, which, which you referred to by its really excellent name, Block. I, I, I'm, I'm so impressed you guys got that ticker, uh, considering how great it is. What are you seeing in there? I mean, is that being also lifted up during this period? And, and what is the is a relationship between, you know, I noticed that, for example, PayPal is a big constituent of both iBuy and Block. Are you seeing any connection between those two? PayPal is, you know, kind of, I don't want to say kicked off a good part of the Bitcoin rally this year, but maybe came in kind of in the second phase of the Bitcoin rally and kind of announced that its platform is going to be able to kind of process, you know, cryptocurrency payments to Bitcoin specifically, which is a massive, massive user base and uh, global. And, um, you know, we heard earlier in the year Square was going to do that as well. So, um, you know, these companies that are embracing cryptocurrency as a form of currency and payment is definitely very positive. And, um, you know, when we launched our block ETF, we originally filed with uh, the name of it having blockchain in it. And, you know, when you look at what blockchain technology is, um, you know, blockchain technology is kind of the technology that powers um, uh, cryptocurrency. You know, cryptocurrency is built on blockchain technology. Sort of like, you know, internet technology, one of the applications of internet technology was websites or another application of internet technology was email. So most people, you know, discovered maybe email first and then realized, oh, this is part of the internet or they discovered a website first and then, okay, I understand the internet. So the same has happened with blockchain technology, kind of the most popular, widely known application of, of blockchain technology is, is Bitcoin in cryptocurrencies. Uh, but that's flowing increasingly um, into kind of a new awareness, which is some of the ways to use blockchain uh, for to keep transaction records, to make uh, data sharing more efficient, to create trusted uh, data sharing, whether that's you know private blockchains or public blockchains. Just simply a lot of um, ledger accounting trust-based work that's done inefficiently today that blockchain has a real chance to trans transform and almost like how information sharing used to happen pre-internet um, and the opportunity the internet made to really um, kind of uh, really grow exponentially the ability to uh, share information that's what we think blockchain is going to be able to do for trust and transactions and record keeping. And we're definitely seeing more and more companies work on projects for everything from food safety uh, to uh, tracking shipping containers to even tracking uh, PPE equipment around the world. Block has, is, has a variety of different types of companies in there from you know, companies that uh, create mining equipment for uh, uh, Bitcoin uh, to uh, companies that operate uh, cryptocurrency exchanges, to companies that uh, do banking and investing in um, kind of the blockchain cryptocurrency space. And we also have different technology companies that are actively um, investing in uh, uh, blockchain applications, as well as financial companies that are doing it. And it's really not designed to be a Bitcoin ETF. It's really kind of designed to invest in areas that are in companies that are related to blockchain, which does include some crypto. Uh, but we think it's a unique thematic um, way to invest in the space uh, from an equity standpoint. And uh, there's not many ways to do that currently without maybe opening a digital wallet um, there is no Bitcoin ETF. At some point, there might be. Uh, so we think this is kind of a compelling way to uh, have exposure to blockchain technology in general. And, um, you know, we feel like um, it's one of the disruptive themes we want to be a part of and offer access to for investors. So as we wrap up, not to uh, change the mood from all the, the positive, uh, you know, all-time highs we've been discussing, but, you know, the market goes up, the market goes down. Uh, you mentioned a couple of times the Black Swan ETF. What is a Black Swan market event and how does NYC Architecture Swan fit into that? 
Yeah, so black swan events, you know, generally are you know declines in the market of you know, fifteen or twenty percent, and they're usually based off a risk or an event that investors really haven't foreseen or didn't expect. So there is some argument whether or not you know COVID is a black swan event. Uh, certainly, with the S and P down over thirty percent at the low, it qualifies for a pretty massive. Um, uh, market disrupting event and not to the downside. Uh, I think the question is, you know, did we, did investors kind of, should they have started to expect it once news came out from China, I think in early January and, and, you know, and could, so, you know, I, I look at it and say, simply from a market impact uh, standpoint, this was a black swan event. And, you know, but, and uh, about two years ago, we launched an ETF, uh, ticker SWAN, Amplify Black SWAN, Growth and Treasury Core ETF, a lot of words there, um, based off a strategy that really is designed to hedge against significant market disruptions like black swan events, but at the same time, allow you to participate in the upside of the S&P 500. And, um, you know, almost a little bit like a balanced fund does, but this is definitely different than a balanced fund. And uh, this year, Swan, you know, at the COVID low, when uh, the S&P was off a little over 30%, was off, Swan was off a little over 5%. So it really kind of proved its mettle. And then in 2019, when the S&P had a great year, it was up 31%, Swan returned 22%. So the thought on this is to not take these massive losses or try to avoid these massive losses during you know black swan type events, um, but then also you know during the kind of constant upward movement of, of the market over time, not just um, not just sit there and, and kind of whittle away, thus being able to participate in the uh, upside of the S and P. So this we think is a, a real important core strategy for investors who can't stomach or can't afford to take a black swan type loss. Um, yeah, the S&P was down 30% for a little bit, and it didn't matter to you if you didn't feel any pressure and sell at those lows. But I think we all know we're human, and um, unfortunately, many people do kind of sell low and buy high. And during that kind of stress event and all the headlines that were happening, uh, it didn't seem too crazy to sell when the S&P was down 30%. And many people who are nearing retirement or are retired it really probably hurt them quite a bit if they got out of the market. Um, likewise, if you're constantly waiting for a black swan to happen and have your money in cash and aren't able to participate in the U.S. equity market or equity type returns, uh, that doesn't really, you have to have a, a massive amount of money saved because you're not getting much in cash nowadays to really keep up with inflation or cost of living. So you, we think you do still need some equity exposure. So SWAN is kind of that in-between core type holding, I think, for investors that, again, allows them kind of some of that uh, hedge ability against these um, sudden shocks to the market, but also that nice ability to participate in the upside. And unlike some ETFs that might have a cap on how high you can go up in a year or a cap on how low you can go, there is no caps. So there's really no um, timing that you have to worry about and, or artificial upside or downside limits. Uh, it's just, you know, really just a standard ETF that can be added to a core and we think is very complimentary. And yeah, that's our Black Swan ETF nearing, uh, you know, $750 million in AUM, assets under management over the last two years and uh, something that's handily actually outperformed the S&P over the last two years. And if you look back at the last two years, we've had some pretty big up. Uh, periods in the market and some decent sized down drawdowns. Um, so we're we're pleased to have that on the market, and uh, you know it was it was a nice addition to many of our other products that can have some um, a lot of volatility associated with them because they tend to be heavily leaning into growth and disruption. Uh, so Black Swan is kind of a nice offset to that in our product line, and we think a nice addition to investors' core portfolios. So, and you mentioned uh, the, all the other ones. Uh, we unfortunately don't have time to go through every single one. So where can our listeners find out more about Amplify ETFs and all the different strategies your products offer them? So you can visit our website. It's amplifyetfs.com and you'll find all of our information on our funds, 
There's videos, explainers of our funds. There's uh, white papers, lots of data, performance, historical kind of track record. Um, we'd love to have you visit our site and you probably run into an ETF or two that you're interested in that you didn't even know we had at the time. So uh, hopefully you enjoy um, browsing kind of this unique collection of, of products. Thanks so much, Christian, for joining us inside the Ice House. Thanks, Pete. I really appreciate it. That's our conversation for this week. Our guest was Christian Magoon, founder and CEO of Amplify ETFs. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. Got a comment or question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show? Email us at icehouse at theice.com or tweet at us at Icehouse Podcast. Our show was produced by Ken Abel with production assistance from Steve Romanchik and Ian Wolf. I'm Pete Ash, your host, signing off from the Library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied, as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 